Hello, and welcome back to the channel. For today's topic, we have the ultimate petty revenge stories people have seen or been a part of. Don't forget to like and subscribe to support us. I had a roommate who would always turn the AC down to like 60 degrees overnight, just way too cold for most folks. I tried getting up in the middle of the night and setting it to something more reasonable like 65 degrees. He'd always set it back. I tried to talk to him about it multiple times. He would never compromise. We all had private bathrooms in this house. My other roommate would always wake up early and shower before me. My inconsiderate roommate was the type to sleep in as late as possible and shower at the last minute before jetting out the door for work. One morning I realized that if I left my bathroom door open into my bedroom, the heat from our super hot water would actually heat my entire room and make the temperature tolerable. Once I figured that out, I would run my shower at max hot for like 30 minutes to heat my room, turning it off right before I left for work, leaving my uncooperative roommate with ice cold water for his showers. I did this for months and he never could bother to just wake up earlier. Several of my friends in college were members of the campus Jewish fraternity. The house had two kitchens, a regular kitchen where most of the food was made, and a kosher kitchen for special events and feeding the brothers that kept kosher. There were only a few brothers that had keys to the kosher kitchen, because if it was contaminated, it had to be re-koshered in a lengthy process by whoever committed the violation. One of the older brothers, who had kosher kitchen access, started to become possessive of the house GameCube, which the other guys were pretty much constantly using. In order to be able to play whenever he wanted, he started locking the GameCube away in the kosher kitchen, much to the dismay of the rest of the house. This petty and egregious power trip pissed off my friends, who decided to get back at him by hiding a strip of bacon in the GameCube CD tray. Sure enough, he put the GameCube away in the kosher kitchen, bacon and all, inadvertently breaking kosher and forcing him to clean the whole room. The GameCube issue stopped the next day. Ooh, oh, I got one. I dated a girl a while back for a bit, and we decided we wanted to go see a concert that we both would have enjoyed. The concert was about six months out from the date the tickets went on sale, but I bought some for us anyway. I figured it would be smooth sailing until the concert because everything was going well between the two of us anyway, so I figured, why not? At $100 a ticket, I think it would be a fun event to go to in the future and give us something to look forward to. So I bought the physical tickets, and when they came in, I gave them to her as a birthday present. At this point, the concert was only a couple months out, no biggie, right? Wrong. As you may have guessed, the relationship didn't work out so well, we shall say mutual differences occurred. Well, she started giving stuff back that I gifted her over time, but she never gave me the concert tickets back. Darn. Thinking I was out of luck, I was about to count those off as a loss and get over it when I decided to call Ticketmaster and see what happens to tickets that are lost or stolen. As it happens, as long as you have the same credit card and an ID you use to purchase said tickets, they can automatically issue you new ones. So what happens to the old ones? They become invalidated, but the person won't know that unless they attempt to go to the concert with them. I think you see where this is going. Now since I was pretty upset, I called her up and explicitly asked about the tickets. Hyper petty, I know, but nonetheless, she ignored the question and did not even say something like, F you, I'm not giving those back. She just simply pretended not to hear me. Well, I had already issued new tickets, and had she said something to me, I would have let her know that but she didn't want to make amends about it, so F her. I brought my best friend at the time to the concert. The show was great, fantastic even. No, F you text messages, no illicit Facebook posts. Nothing. I figured she sucked it up and didn't go, because imagine the embarrassed feeling you'd get going to a concert assuming with someone else because you had two tickets only to be told at the gate that your tickets don't work because they were flagged for being stolen. Awkward. Now I have to preface this by saying that my tickets were in a really inconvenient location in the arena. Meaning that people in the section we were in really had to go out of their way to get to this section, basically one concourse in or out of the nosebleed section of the arena. If you are going to meet someone, chances are good. The only reason you'll see them is if they deliberately came to your section. Nearing the end of the concert, the band walks off, and just before they came back on for their encore, I kept getting this really uncomfortable feeling that someone was watching me. So I look out of the corner of my eye toward the concourse, and I see a figure of a woman walking down the hallway. No. Way. She was there, right? Anyway, I ignore this odd feeling because who would, after being embarrassed at the entrance to the concert, go and scalp, because the show was sold out, another ticket just to come up to the section you were supposed to have seats in just to see if your ex was actually using the tickets? Crazy right? 
Yeah, I thought so too. It turns out she really did buy another ticket. Mind you, she brought her friend to the concert to go to the concert, but because I reissued tickets, they would have had to scalp two tickets, but she didn't. A couple of decades ago, I was renting a house in the Seattle area, and my landlord was a really subpar property management company. I had a lot of disagreements with them, but when I moved out, I cleaned the whole house, and nothing had been damaged. Regardless, they decided to keep my $850 deposit, plus they had the audacity to say I owed them an additional $10 for cleaning costs. Right at the time, I was a victim of a violent crime, and I had to move for reasons related to that. I didn't have the time or energy to argue with them about the $860, and I'd been hospitalized. Feeling beleaguered, I took the first apartment I could afford, and it had cockroaches. I hadn't noticed them when I was looking at the place, but after I moved in, I saw them. I felt devastated, so many bad things piling up on me. That's when I got an idea. I started to catch the cockroaches in a jar and save them. After about a week, I had a good number of live cockroaches in my jar, so I drove down to the property management office to pay the $10. In the lobby, the secretary asked what I needed, and I replied that I thought I owed them some money, but wasn't sure how much. The secretary got up and left the lobby to find my file, leaving me totally alone. At that point, I opened my backpack and took out the jar of roaches, opened it, and let them scurry away. Within seconds they had disappeared under floorboards and furniture. A moment later, the secretary came out and said, Oh yes, you owe us $10. I paid them and left with a big smile on my face. Petty revenge? Yes. Do I feel guilty? No. One of my housemates at uni kept complaining about people leaving hair in the shower. Whilst this is a valid complaint, it was long and blonde, whereas everyone in the house had dark hair, and myself and my buddy, who were the main targets of her complaining, had short hair. Well, my friend decided he wanted revenge, and luckily, his mum owns a few hairdressing salons. So, he told her about this plan, gathered up a bunch of cuttings from the salons, snuck the bags in whilst the girl was out, then waited until the following Friday, as she was the only one in the house over the weekend. When she left for lecture, we dumped these large bags of hair into the shower. It looked like someone had shaved a bear. Anyway, we got back on Monday, she didn't say anything, and she never complained about hair being in the shower again. Victim of one. I ordered pizza and a diet Pepsi because I was working on a house we just bought and we didn't have any furniture, let alone a fridge and stove. I get back to work and lose track of the time. Just as I remember the pizza is taking too long, the doorbell rings. I look at my phone and it's been over an hour, easy. The guy hands me the stuff and I tip my usual $5 that which is over 20% of what I paid. I don't know who's at fault for the late delivery and I'm tired and hungry. I plop down on my paint bucket chair and paint bucket table to partake in my only meal of the day. It's burned. The pepperoni are charred and the cheese is yellow. I grab my cup to pour myself a tall frosty diet Pepsi. It's brisk iced tea or some iced tea, which I don't care for. I call the store and the manager is unavailable. I instead tell the guy that answered what happened. He looks up my order and then comes back with a very apathetic sorry. I tell him the scenario about me just moving in and how I'm covered in paint and would have picked up the pizza otherwise. There's a brief pause and he says, Oh. You're not Melinda and Mario, insert last name and address? No. I don't know anyone by that name, but that's the right address. Oh. So they don't live there? No. We just bought the place a few weeks ago and I'm the only one here. Oh, cause they didn't want to pay or tip the driver a few times, so they kind of owe us. Yeah, well that's not me and you guys really messed up my order. I can send you pictures and there's no way I could have messed with it because I don't even have any furniture in here. To which he said, no, I believe you. Let me see who can I get out there and get you another order. I got the order in 25 minutes with the correct drink. I talked to the driver and she said the previous people were rude and never tipped. She said, they probably thought you were them. I had transferred to a very small private school my junior year of high school. Not my choice, but my parents moved to a rough area and my mother worked a second job to keep me in there because the public school was known to have low graduation rates compared to other public schools in the neighboring cities. For that, I'm forever grateful. I had gone from being somewhat cool, to the new kid without friends. It lent a lot of perspective and empathy and from it I learned a sense of compassion for anyone being the noob in a class or job scenario as I became an adult. Anyway, transferring in, I sat in the hallway outside the principal's office as the administrative work was being taken care of. Across from me was John, without the H, who was awaiting discipline for something, though I'm not entirely sure. He looked me up and said, 
What the heck are you looking at? Being a former cool kid, I laughed under my breath, rolled my eyes and shrugged it off. That did not go well with him. He told me to go F myself and he'd see me later just before he went into the office to receive whatever discipline he was there for. Throughout my junior year, I'd be called names, shoulder checked, even spit it by John. I eventually made friends at the school, so it was tolerable. I always kept my cool. Being a small school, we also were on the baseball team together. I was somewhat of a standout and was awarded captain of the team and on the field John and I had a mutual respect and common goal of winning. However, towards the end of the season he broke that mutual respect by taking a pee in my baseball bag, soaking my helmet and glove. It has always smelled like pee since. I never ratted him out because it just wasn't my thing. I don't discount others for doing it, especially in a bullying or dangerous situation, but it just wasn't for me. But, I was at the point where I had had enough. I was going to get him back. He had a class in a period before mine. We had the same desk and he'd often leave me notes that said, F you on them. Looking back, I now think it's kind of funny. But he had made the mistake of leaving a graded test behind one Friday. He had a D so I know it wasn't a token for him to show his parents. I took it and devised my plan for revenge. I wrote on the back, senior prank ideas. Listed a bunch of preposterous ideas like, cow on top floor, set off sprinklers, call in 100 pizzas and finally throw a mattress in the pool among others. I did my best to mimic his writing. The following weekend, I had drove around town found a mattress of the side of the road, hopped the fence of the neighboring K though 8th grade campus and dragged the mattress, with a senior's O2 spray painted on it over the fence and into the pool. The thing about throwing a mattress into a pool is, once it's soaked, it absorbs a ton of water and becomes very difficult to pull out from the deep end. The school had to rent a bobcat to pull it out. It snagged and ripped and a bunch of foam and debris littered the pool and the school had to drain and clean the pool and fill it again. Needless to say, it was an expensive fix. The following Monday, I had left his test behind as if it had been there all weekend. Somebody in another class had turned it in to the teacher who then turned it into the principal. John was soon after expelled, because it would have been his third strike at the school. They couldn't simply suspend him this time. So he left the school, and finished the last two months of the semester at another school and graduated. From what I heard, his parents didn't even believe him when he was questioned and denied doing it. I had a bit of guilt at the time because I was worried I may have set him on course for disaster in life. But through Facebook, I eventually saw he took over his father's successful plumbing business and is doing okay so I don't feel as much guilt as I used to. I acknowledge how I what I did for revenge was messed up and could have been disastrous for him. But he rebounded in life just fine. I just hope that he learned he can't get away with pulling his stuff every time that there is always some force keeping tabs and he treats others with a little more respect. I'm sure karma will get me back someday but in the immortal words of Daniel Cormier, fuck John. No kidding, there I was. US Army MP Osset, basic training plus job school combined, we had to do this thing called fire guard, where pairs of people have to stay up and watch each bay of the barracks, while another pair had to clean. After an hour, the pairs would switch with two new pairs. This particular night, my bunkmate who had decided to go from being a decent guy to being a real jerk refused to get up to help me with cleaning, meaning I had to clean both four stall bathrooms by myself. A little more background, everyone knows that in basic you have to make your bed to the army standard. We had these things called dust covers, which were essentially wool blankets cut in half used to cover our pillows when our beds were made. Well, in my desperate search for a way to get back at this guy who had been such a pain, I decided that the best way would be to clean all the toilets with his dust cover while he lazily slumbered. And so I did. And returned it to his bed. It felt excellent. I once lived with two roommates, one of which who bullied me, she'd give me the silent treatment, comment on my weight pretending she didn't know I was around listened to TV slash music on blast while I was sleeping on her days off, tried to get one of my boyfriends to sleep with her and spread rumors about him when he didn't, and never paid me in time for any of our bills, among other things, while we lived together. It got so bad for me that I would cry on my way commute home, too broke to move and too anxious to spend another night in that apartment. She worked at 9 to 5 while I worked nights. When I finally was able to move out I crafted my revenge. Her bedroom door had no lock. The morning I moved was a weekday and she worked I got several shrimp and taped a few to the inside of the air vents in her room. With some help, we lifted her bed and I removed the foot pads of her metal tubing bed frame, and put several shrimp in before closing them back up. Lastly, my, then, boyfriend surprised me with a box with some moth larvae. She was terrified of moths. After she spread rumors about him, I'm not surprised he wanted to get revenge also. He placed them in her closet, hidden in some sweaters. Petty? 
You bet. But after trying to fix our relationship several times, and over a year of stress, I don't regret it one bit. Years later, I saw our other roommate. Upon catching up, he told me you picked a great time to move out, shortly after you left we were dealing with this crazy moth infestation. I was a teller at a bank. My main job was to refer clients to bankers, salespeople, and their job was to close the sale. I was previously a banker at a different institution, and so I knew the entire process inside out and led the bank in referrals and referred sales company-wide. There was a new banker who was particularly rude to me. Why was she so rude? I think she was just a bad person and only showed people respect when she thought it would benefit her. Anyhow, I stopped by her office to check on a big referral. She told me I don't belong in her office and if she wants to update me on a sale she would do so, this meant she blew the sale she was not only new, but had little experience and was terrible at her job. It wasn't out of the ordinary for her to act like this, but was particularly rude because I was honestly wondering what the outcome was for our client. I shrugged, walked out, and never sent her a client again. It didn't matter if the other bankers had their entire week booked with meetings and someone came in looking for an appointment as soon as possible she wasn't getting any more business. This wasn't at the client's expense because as I said, this banker was terrible at her job and I could see the look of confusion and disappoint as client after client walked out of her office empty-handed never to return. She couldn't figure out how to create business from herself, and so without my referrals she posted absolutely no sales indefinitely and eventually had a nervous breakdown from stress and quit. The other bankers, however, did quite well with the extra opportunities I gave them. I went to a huge Oktoberfest celebration and as is tradition, there wasn't enough outhouses for the size of the crowd. Many lines being 10 to 15 people long. Well, as we all know, hours of drinking means it's all gotta go somewhere. So a couple people in my group all go and stand in line in the same time. Lines are moving decently well but lines of 10 to 15 people with a full bladder is still a long time no matter how many times you hop up and down. Well, we get to the point where we are almost next and this one girl, you know the kind that is just hot enough to get by on her looks but not hot enough to really make money off her looks, starts kinda doing this cutesy walk up sideways perpendicular to the lines. She tries flirting with the guy in front of us who promptly told her the back of the line was way over there. She gets all pissy and complains to her boyfriend who had walked up. One of the outhouses opens up she dashes in saying sorry not sorry. Well, there was an anger built up from the discomfort of a full bladder and waiting 20 minutes for some girl to just cut and expecting special treatment so my buddies and I started chanting what a bitch. What a bitch. At the top of our lungs. A decent amount of other people who saw what happened joined in until she exited the outhouse where there were quite a bunch of FUs exchanged back and forth. Well, her boyfriend keeps trying to encourage her to leave and let it be since the angry drunk crowd was starting to turn and he didn't want to get dragged into where he was going to have to defend her, but she refused to let it go. That was until she got struck by sopping wet ball of paper towels or toilet paper that came from the direction of the outhouses. Everyone was pretty shocked as she let out a blood-curdling scream over it. I actually felt bad for her for a few seconds. We were all pissed for being forced to wait but I didn't think it warranted a presumably piss-soaked ball of paper towels to the head. Freshman year of college when I got paired up with four girls to do a group assignment who regularly sat together and did nothing but gossip, I was pretty much 100% done with group projects and refused to ever do them again. These four girls did nothing for the six weeks we had to work on the project and while I did my part, I wanted to really mess with them over it. I stayed up the two nights before it was due working on it, turning a 15-slide assignment that was supposed to be brief and well summarized into a 60-slide monster. When it came time for us to present, I had let the girls know I did the slides and that I'd present first and then they could just read off them. They were 100% super thankful and happy about this which just made me even more mad. I loaded up the PowerPoint, did my six slides, which contained all of the information needed for our portion of the assignment, and then let them just go on and on and on, not realizing they were repeating stuff every other slide, talking over information not relevant at all to the project, and the struggle of them clicking next and never getting to the last slide. I watched those girls flounder and it was glorious. My professor ended up asking me after class what the heck was going on and when I explained, she told me she'd evaluate what was done and get back to me. I got an A for the assignment and the girls would give me glares the rest of the semester and I'd just flip them off, still upset, I'd quit they got for a grade or if they had to repeat it. F those girls, F group projects. I once worked for a boost juice bar and one day a woman came in with her friend. Lady number one wanted a wheatgrass shot which was $2.20. She gave me a $20 note for it and I asked if she had anything smaller. She apologized and said she didn't, I said no problem, here's your change. No hard feelings, whatever. Her friend, 
Lady number two then smirks at lady number one and says ha, watch this. She then steps up to the register and orders a drink for $4. She proceeds to hand me a $50 note. I see she has a $5 in her wallet and ask if she has anything smaller, she said no, just give me my change and make my drink. Being the petty bitch I am, I hand her $46 back in coins. Not just $1 and $2 coins, I did about $10 worth of change in 20 cent pieces and a large portion in 50 cent pieces. I had done the banking for that day and still had time to go to the bank and get any other change if I needed to. Her face as I gave her all that change was priceless. I closed the register, walked off and made their orders. It still makes me laugh, 10 years later. I once was good friends with two women, who were friends with each other. Call them Kate and Jane. Kate and I had a falling out with Jane. Over what, we don't know. She suddenly became antisocial, cruel, and vicious. The evening of the big fallout, we all had agreed to hang out late in the evening. I go to Jane's apartment and knock, no answer. Kate shows up, I tell her Jane isn't answering the door. She says she's probably got those damn headphones on again. I'll knock on the window. So she does. Jane comes to the door screaming at us. Why did we wake her up? Did we know what time it was? How hard it was for her to sleep? We were shocked. We reminded her we'd all agreed to meet at 11. I'd spoken to her not three hours before and she said she was excited. She kept berating us. We finally told her it was fine if she didn't want to hang out with us, but she should have sent us a text or something when she changed her mind and we wouldn't have bothered her and she should go back inside. Kate and I went across the courtyard to my apartment, Jane and I are neighbors, and sat outside drinking and smoking and talking. Much of the talk centered around how much Jane had changed, how rude and mean she'd been, and how we were sick of her shit and having to constantly maneuver around her easily bruised ego. Kate was pretty drunk, so she sent for an Uber to get home, but she also needed to pee really badly. I told her to use my bathroom, but I had a large pit bull at the time, R.I.P. Cooper, and she was scared of him. So she decided to pop a squat outside. But being drunk and still pissed at Jane, she also decided to take her revenge. She walked across the courtyard, yanked down her pants, and pissed all over Jane's welcome mat, stoop, and door. Laughing hysterically the whole time. I just sat there dumbfounded. Kate pulled her pants up and said that's what I think of her now. The Uber came, she left, and it was never mentioned again. My ex, many moons ago, was a flipping idiot. She knew. Knew. That I had many friends that lived in the same neighborhood as her ex that she had left a couple months before dating me. She always told me she was going over at GF's house to study, and I had no reason not to believe her. Till one day she wouldn't answer a single text. Now I'm not the kind of guy to text a billion times. I'll text you, then if you don't reply, ma IB I'll text you two to three hours later to make sure you got my last message, and if you still don't answer, then, may, I'll talk to you when you feel like you want to talk. So anyway, I'm at my friend's house later that night having not gotten a reply from her since maybe 12 hours ago. Me and the group of friends decide to go outside in his backyard to make a pit fire, when I notice her car in the driveway of the house behind us. I didn't know it was her ex's house but it was the way wrong neighborhood for her girlfriend's house. I call her sister up and say where is your sister, and she says oh she's at, girl's name's house. Well I'm going flipping nuts then because I'm looking at her car now and this isn't, girl's name's neighborhood. Her response to that was uh. So I hang up and ask my friend who lives in the house we were all hanging out at, who owns the house behind him. Oh that's, her ex bf's name's house. I called her phone to find it was off. So I just chilled the rest of my time there, and paid it no more attention, no sense in worrying at this point it's a done deal. About two hours later I get a call from her saying the phone was on silent for study purposes and if I wanted to come over. Sure I told her. I arrive at the house a little bit after and she hops in the car, and as soon as she shuts the door I ask how I was studying with, girlfriend's name, and she gives me some nonsense answer like I didn't know. After she's done spewing her lie I say weird. Must have been a long walk from, XBF's, house. I made sure to look at her face as I said it so that I could see any expression. She knew I knew but wouldn't let it go. It will go quicker if I just give you the dialogue. We were just talking things out. Why would it be okay to just go over there to do that if you have a boyfriend? Talk things out? What needs to be talked out? We've been friends for a very long time before dating. I can't just stop talking to him. So to get around that, you feel it's logical to lie to me about going to, girlfriend's, house? It's 11 p.m., you've been talking it out since 10 a.m. I've tried getting a hold of you a couple times too. Silence for a bit. So what did you guys do? 
She wouldn't answer or look at me. I told her to get out of the car and just pulled off. She broke up with him the first time because he was physically abusive. And about a year after I drove off she calls me asking if we could try to make it work again and if I'd like to get together over dinner. So I said yes and arranged a date a a fairly upscale place for Saturday at 8pm told her the dress code and all, since it was a snazzy joint. I'm not sure how long she sat there, because I didn't go. I used to be best friends with this girl that whenever she met someone she'd practically forget about me, like she'd literally ignore me like I didn't exist. Anywho, we went together on a trip and met a group of girls, and she obviously chose them over me and hung out with them all day, acting like they all were best friends or something, but as soon as they weren't around anymore she instantly started talking shit about them. One day she went to hang out with them as usual and she forgot some camera at our hotel room, she kept bragging about it because it was pretty expensive and had Wi-Fi, I don't know, who cares, and when I saw it on the bed I decided to hide it somewhere. An important detail I forgot to mention is that we were sharing our room with two other girls we didn't know much. They seemed nice though, but she hated them and kept telling me that they were low class and looked like thieves or something. Pretty sure she was just mad because one of the first days we were trying swimsuits and I got complimented by them. She on the other hand got told that she looked weird because her legs were skinny but she had a big belly. Anywho, when she got back she obviously realized her camera was gone and started freaking out. I pretended to help her look around for it and just when I was about to tell her that I hit it as a joke the other girls came in the room and she immediately turned around and started yelling at them. She kept screaming that she knew they were thieves from the very first moment she saw them and that she wanted her camera back. Obviously the other girls called her a snob and she stormed off and demanded we got other roommates because she refused to stay with poor low class people that steal. Anyway everything escalated quickly so when everyone was gone I grabbed the camera and put it somewhere else she could find it easily. Next day she had her camera back but the atmosphere in the room was heavy as f since everyone hated each other except for me. My best friend thanked me for staying with her unlike her new friends who decided to go party instead of helping her look for camera and hung out with me the rest of the trip. This happened like 6 years ago. Never ever told her the truth, not even when I stopped hanging out with her. When I was a freshman in high school, I rode the school bus with the middle school and high school kids. We had this one little special snowflake on our bus that year, who just didn't understand how the bus worked. He would get on the bus and try and sit with the high school kids and would harass the younger kids to try and get our attention. He would say all sorts of gross and nasty things to the girls on the bus and laugh thinking we would think he was cool. I kept telling this kid it wasn't cool and the only thing he was doing was ticking us off with his immaturity. Being a special snowflake he thought he just needed to up his antics. So one day, I'm sitting on the bus listening to my awesome CD player and trying to forget about the day I had. This kid had other ideas and decided to continue to harass a bunch of young girls on the bus. The words coming out of his mouth were so over the top, and nasty that two of this girl started crying and that's when I had enough of this kid's issues. I told him very nicely to stop it or I would make him stop and he wasn't going to like what I did. He just smiled and turned around and continued to harass these girls. So I got out of my seat, and pushed him over into his seat and sat down. I got real close to his face and started to tell him off. He turned his head away from me to ignore what I was telling him. So I grabbed him by his hair, mind you I had winter gloves on at the time, and turned him to face me. I told him that if he ever harassed another kid on the school bus that I would make sure that he didn't walk home when he got off the bus but would be crawling from the ass whooping that would come his way. I could tell this kid was a little scared but I don't think he thought I was serious. I got up out of my seat and told the girls to let me know if he so much as smiled at them wrong, and I went back to my sit. The next day my parents get a call from the schools that there is going to be a meeting with both the middle school and high school principals, the bus driver, the kid and his parents and my parents. The special snowflakes parents wanted me to be suspended for harassing their baby and they weren't going down without a fight. This is where I decide to get my revenge and take this kid down. After everyone arrives the meeting gets started and the adults want to hear each kid's side of the story. I told them that the special snowflake can go first, and I listened and waited to see what he had to say. He goes on this long ramble about how mean, and horrible I have been to him since the school year has started and how he feels harassed by me every day and doesn't feel safe on the same bus as me. The whole time, my dad is taking notes as the kid is talking, and at one point his parents stopped the kid and asked my dad what he was doing. My dad looks up from his notebook and stared straight into the kid's father's eyes and says I need accurate notes for our lawyer. Then went back to taking notes. The kid's father just snorts and says, you forget what your kid's done to mine. I should be the one taking the notes. The special snowflake ends his sob story with those special tears and even has this smirk on his face as if he won the war. After he was done, the adults, not my parents though, looked at me like I was the worst kid they have ever had to deal with and they were ready to throw me out of their school that very moment.
I started off by asking the adults in the room, when they will be reviewing the video from the school bus. As a side note, the school that year had put cameras in all the new school buses so that in the event of something like this happening there would be documentation and proof. However what the school didn't tell the parents was that not all the buses had functioning cameras, it turned out that every one out of three buses had a camera that was recording the other two buses just had the dummy cameras. I had found out the first few weeks of school that our bus only had a dummy camera because our bus driver had never had any problems on her route and she didn't request her bus to have one. I had asked her when we first got the bus and I noticed that the camera didn't have a red light on during the ride. So I knew when the special snowflake and I had our little discussion that there wasn't going to be a recording. So after I asked that, the principals had to explain to both sets of parents that the camera was actually a dummy camera and there was no recording. So I went on with my side of the story, and advised all the adults that the kid was lying and that I never actually laid my hands on him. I however admitted to his father and mother that yes I did threaten the kid and that I know I shouldn't have, but their child was out of control. The revenge part, I pulled out of my backpack a list that I had started to compile after the officer showed up at my house and the time of the meeting. I had gone to every person on our school bus and had them write down everything they could remember that this special snowflake had been saying to them since school had started. At the time of the meeting, I had four pages of handwritten quotes from all the kids. I asked the adults in the room, if it was okay for me to read off what this kid had been saying to the young girls on the school bus. They of course gave me the go ahead, and I started to list all the things he was saying. Each time, I got to a swear word or nasty statement, I would hesitate and ask if it was okay if I said these words out loud. I think I had gotten only 5 or 6 of quotes out before the adults told me to stop. I made everyone in the room so uncomfortable with what this kid had been saying to all the young girls that they couldn't listen to it anymore. When I looked up the special little snowflake's father looked like he was ready to have a heart attack, his face was a shade of red I had never seen before. As I was about to continue on to why, I did what I did, the father interrupted me. He turns to his son and asked him if any of these things were true that he supposedly said. The kid of course started to stutter and tried to say no. I looked at the principals and the adults, and pulled out my last bit of revenge, yet another list. I handed it to the middle school principal and advised her that each of those names on the list were kids that were harassed and are willing to come in with their parents to discuss what has been happening on the school bus. At this point the kid just all out started bawling his eyes out to the point that snot and tears were running down his face and shirt and he couldn't talk. After a few minutes he finally calmed down and his father told him, he had one more chance to tell the truth otherwise things were going to be very serious when they got home. The kid finally looked up from the table and said in the weakest voice, that yes he did say all those things to the girls on the bus. I swear to this day, the look on his father's face was worth all the hassle that my parents and I went through. The kid's father looked like his eyeballs were going to pop out of his head because it was about to explode it. Around this time, the other adults in the room, started to apologize to me about how things escalated to this point and how they can't agree with my actions, they can understand how it happened. I looked the special snowflake in the eye and asked him to explain to the adults in the room that he had also lied about me putting my hands on him. Everyone waited for his response and all the kid could say was sorry, I lied about that too. In the end the special snowflake was so special that mom and dad had to drive him to school every day because he was kicked off the bus for the remaining school year. 